Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday q and I'm Eric Griffin, president of iTeam Trading. With me, I have Lynette Zhang, our chief market analyst. For those of you who don't know or are tuning in for the first time, submit your questions to us via email at questions at itmtrading.com. I take them, I put them up here on the screen, and I ask them live so you get a real, true, organic response. So Mary S. asks, Okay. Why are there differences in oh. price in various silver products when they are used in the future to sell or barter? Doesn't one ounce of silver pay out the same regardless of the type? Well, there are different price, and you could actually probably answer this one a little bit better mm -hmm. because that you work in inside of the product. Do you so, want me to? Please go ahead. So, I, I want to make sure they get the real answer. Okay, so the various silver products have different. All the different mints charge different prices for their product to the wholesale market above and beyond just the spot price, depending on um, if it's a generic or if it's a um, like Popular. a government mint. So the U.S. Mint mm -hmm. charges more, you know, for their Silver Eagle than Highland Mint charges for their Buffalo Silver Rounds. And when you sell them in the future, just in a regular market, not considering like a reset or a barter situation, then um, the wholesale market pays more for an American Silver Eagle than it would for a Highland Mint Buffalo Silver Round. So, you know, it's kind of you buy, you pay more, but you get more or you pay less and you get less. Um, in a bartering situation, that's tough to say mm -hmm. what exactly will happen because nobody in the United States, we've never really had that situation where there was a complete you know, economic meltdown and people had to resort to bartering for things. But um, an ounce of silver, it would probably, in my opinion, would probably be just worth an ounce of silver, whatever the and and that could be. I think that's true. Depending on how cut off we are from you know internet or you know if there was like an EMP attack for example, we'd all be cut off, and so therefore little local markets would would um, begin to er, you know erect themselves, and then you would have you know whatever the going rate in that local market would be. So it'd be tough to say. It's what makes that second part of the question tough to answer. It, you don't, we don't really know. It's going to depend on how, what happens and how it unfolds. That's true. But what we do know is that, and in fact, I, I showed that a little while ago, there was a video that came to us from Venezuela where they weren't doing it with silver, but they were doing it with gold. And then they would put the weight in and on the scale. And so it was what, whatever spot was at would be what they were what they were allowing them to use to barter for food with. Mm. And they preferred the gold over the paper. In fact, they used the, the bills. Over the silver or the paper? No, the paper. Okay. Uh, they actually used like a $20,000 or 20,000 Bolivar note is what wrapped their little teeny pieces of gold in. So, so in the video, they were actually using like little grams of gold? Yes, they were. Hmm and weighing them out and using them for food. And the food was actually priced in grams of gold. Uh, I'll have to look at it again. Did it, Edgar, do you think, do you remember if it had silver? I don't think it had priced in silver on that. I think it was just priced in gold. Yeah, because you translated it. So um, why don't we put the link to that video okay. yeah, that'd in be this cool. one? And that way you guys can that. go and, and look at that again. Okay, but uh, that that's my <coughs> my bet. I mean, we'll see when it when it happens. But keep in mind too that there's always demand for physical gold and silver in in any kind of form. But um, but my guess it would probably I don't know. It also depends on whether or not there's a confiscation, because if there is indeed a government confiscation and they confiscate the bullion gold and they don't confiscate the collectible gold, which is a historic norm, then if you have the kind of gold that you can actually use in the normal marketplace, that would command a bigger premium. It would certainly create a higher level of demand for it, for sure. Absolutely. Especially as a store of wealth. Exactly. Yeah. So I think it, I think there are different, well, look, there are different kinds of gold and silvers for different kind of functions. Yep. So that's the direction that we go in. Okay, so James D asks, I was wondering when the Great Reset crash happens, 
who okay. will then value what gold and silver prices really are? Huh, that's funny because we were just kind of talking about that. Exactly. Well, you know, what happens is the government and the central banks, I think it'll be a combination of the two, will set a certain amount and it's based typically upon how much cash there is out in the marketplace. So, you know, for our purposes, we use debt because that's how cash is created. And typically things, this is something I learned from my uncle a long time ago. When you're working in the tangible markets, everything goes from undervaluation to fair valuation to overvaluation to fair valuation to undervaluation in, you know, just a continuous loop. So uh, what we don't know and we won't know until it actually happens, you have a certain level of money that's created that you're going to reset with this gold uh, with a revaluation but we don't know what that cover ratio is going to be. So that's a variable that frankly, nobody's gonna know until it actually occurs. Now, I can expand the piece that I'm working on on gold and real estate, and I think we probably should anyway. We haven't had this conversation yet. It was, it was a conversation we were planning on having today, but um, to include some more of those things um, historically since I've gathered all of that data. Yeah, um, still working on the 25 ounces of gold piece, but it's getting it's getting more in depth and even better. So that's I, why it's taking a little bit lo longer time to, to bring it to you guys. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is, I've done, I can't even tell you, I don't even know how many hours of research I've put into this so far. But um, just have a little bit of patience and we'll see that. But initially it will be, you know, the black market, even even the government um, numbers where they suppress the, the price of gold until they do that reset revaluation. Which is what they did in Venezuela. They tried to suppress it for a long time. And they, and they were <laughs> successful at it for a long time, except on the black market. So you have the official price, then you'll have the black market price, and then ultimately you will have the initial and then subsequent reset price. So it isn't that they do it overnight and then the price just stays there. That's usually what happens overnight when they do like a 99 or whatever percent devaluation, whatever that cover ratio is going to be. But then it has a tendency, gold has a tendency to continue spiking up because now it's kind of been let loose from its tether. So it's really interesting, um, and actually, I have a lot of that data that I've gathered for this other piece. So, well, I, I want to expand what we're getting out of this because I've really gathered so much data on so many different areas that can address these questions and more. All right, so Paul asks, Paul S. asks, the price of gold has been revalued many times in the past. Yes. Has the new price always been considered the fundamental price or was some other calculation or method used to determine it? Well, you know, the fundamental <laughs> price is based upon the amount of paper that they put out in circulation. And it's true that the price of gold has been revalued many times in the past. Um, I can talk about in this country, for example, when they shifted and they uh, stated, okay, gold was $20 an ounce, and then it was switched to $35 an ounce. That actually did not reflect its true fundamental value. I did the calculations on that, and if they had really done it to its fundamental value, it should have been about $42.5 an ounce for all the paper that they had created. And that was in 1933? Correct. Okay. Correct. And then again, in 1971, when it went from $35 an ounce to $42.22, okay, that, that did not really reflect its true fundamental value. And we also do know that at that point, um, you know, there was a run on the dollar because in the real marketplace, gold was trading at a much higher level. So governments, individuals couldn't do this anymore, but governments could turn in their dollars in exchange for gold mm. and then go out in the global market and sell it for more. So there was that circumstance. So actually, um, 
you know, the first time is because they didn't feel like the, the population could handle that much of a revaluation. You know, the second time, I mean, the official price of gold is still 4222 They haven't changed that. Right. 50 years. So then you think the last time that the fundamental value of gold was in alignment with the spot market, let's call it, even though it was fixed price, would have been back when it was valued at $20.67 an ounce? Yeah. All right. Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, Jamie O, as the dollar is becoming cheaper, would you say that for someone who holds enough physical precious metals... Investing in real estate at this time is a great way to short the dollar while also acquiring a physical income producing asset in the long run. What I have to say about real estate, well, precious, number one, you never have enough. But if you're executing the strategy and you have any fiat assets covered and you have everything, I, I, at this point, you have to have a place to make your last stand. You have to have a place to live. But for speculation or to generate income, this would be a horrible time to put your money into real estate because the income to cost ratio is completely cattywampus. So it's actually going to cost you to hold on to this property. So as a, as a speculation and to generate income, uh, what you might want to do is actually listen to the... Um, the audio that we did with George Gammon, because that was kind of a question, something like that I asked him before we actually started the video last week. And we did put it up on the podcast, right, Edgar? Yes. So it's up on the podcast and he actually addressed it because of course, you know, that's how he's made a lot of his money is through real estate. And um, that's pretty close to a question that I asked him. So, so Jamie, Go listen to that podcast and listen to what George had to say <clears throat> Edgar, about it. Is that it. easy enough to put the link to that podcast in the description? Yeah. Okay. Okay. We'll that, make it easy make it for you. For him to get to. Yep. Yep. But but in my opinion, absolutely not at this time as a speculative investment. You're buying it severely overvalued, and you're not generating enough income to uh, cover what you're risking. All right, so David J. asked, Lynette has mentioned that the banks are exposed to bail-ins. Mm -hmm. Are business and corporate checking accounts held... <coughs> oh, excuse me. Oh. Maybe you need a sip of water. In a minute. <laughs> um, are business and corporate checking accounts held at the bank exposed to bail-ins? Well, you know, in all of the reading that I've done on the Dodd-Frank... They don't really differentiate between individual accounts or business accounts. They consider all of them deposit accounts. So based on that, I would say that everybody that's got a deposit account at the bank is most likely subject to the bail-ins, frankly. Okay. Okay. I mean, that's, that's, that's what it says. Sweet. They don't, yeah, I mean, they don't really differentiate. So, you know. Can't can't say for sure, but you in your research in the past, it's basically been depositors is what they've said. Correct. Yeah. So that would be whoever is a depositor. Right. Okay, Joseph asks, what would you do, what is your strategy with assets in IRAs and 401ks? How concerned are you regarding assets trapped in IRAs and 401ks? I'm actually pretty con very concerned about it. Uh, as far as the IRAs are concerned, I had a SEP IRA personally, and the choice that I made was to take my distribution and pay my taxes and any penalties, what have you, and then I still have a <laughs> retirement account, but it's in physical metal that I hold. So I, uh, that's, that, that, goes to show you how I feel about IRAs. I don't, I do not currently have an IRA. Um, as far as 401ks are concerned though, most people don't really have access to it. I mean, you had a window during the Cerveza uh, crisis, there was a little window for you to get some money out. But another possible window, if you are still working and still contributing, 
would be to call your administrator and see if you can do what's called an in-service withdrawal rollover election. In-service withdrawal rollover election. If you have the ability to do that, then you can roll, it's usually 50,000 or 50%, whichever is lower, into a traditional IRA. Once it's in a traditional IRA, then you can take a distribution and or pay your buy, taxes and penalties. You, or, you, what? or even buy physical precious metals in that IRA. Yes, Can't but do the question, day, but. yeah, but the question was, um, how concerned was I about getting the wealth out of the IRA. Mm -hmm. So there are some IRA, you know, strategies where you can hold it closer to you or have physical metals inside of there. But um, I'm not comfortable holding it inside there because if you don't hold it, you don't own it. And it's super visible. Uh, 401k, you might also be able to borrow against your 401k and then you pay yourself back over time. If you don't, then it's classified as a distribution and you're paying, you know, taxes on it anyway. So, uh, but the strategy with assets that you cannot remove from those retirement accounts would be to have enough gold offsetting whatever you have in there, so that if that goes to zero, this gets you whole. It gets you whole. Part of the strategy is about um, protecting whatever wealth you have to hold inside of the system. If you have a 403B, frankly, you don't, as long as you're working there, you don't have any choice. You're going to hold it inside the system. So you need to be properly diversified so that no matter what happens to that wealth over there, you are covered and you are recouping any taxes, any fees, any losses, anything. And that's all part of the strategy. All right. So a live question. James R. asks, what happens to real estate taxes in hyperinflation? Hmm. They go up. You know, they we've already witnessed them going up. I mean, one of the reasons why they like property values going up is because even if they don't raise the percentage of tax, they still generate more taxes on the property. But and on your income. And on your income. Yes, it's true. And yeah, I mean, it's really genius. You get to tax the inflation that you created yeah. by the devaluation. I mean, it's genius. But um, yeah, real estate taxes, this, this too is part of the strategy because real estate basically runs um, a couple of risks and the taxes in real estate is definitely one of them and mortgages the other one. So yeah, they keep going up because that's how they generate income. All right, well, that's it for the questions for this week. Oh, okay. So uh, yesterday I was on with Jake Ducey on I Love Prosperity. And, you know, he really is like one of my favorite millennials. I, I now have several, but it really, <laughs> it really gives me a lot of hope when I see younger people that are, that are paying attention. Is he a millennial? I think so. How old is he? Mm, I'm not sure, but he's, he's in his 20s. Kind of to me. Oh, well, maybe he's, like he's a not a, a Gen Z. A Gen Z? Okay. Well... Then I guess my other millennial <laughs> won't get insulted. Exactly. Because he's a Gen Zer. He's a well, Gen then I'll Zer. say he's my favorite Gen Zer. That's right. <laughs> um, but we'll let you know when those links are out. And I'm also really excited about Jake because he's coming up to my bug out house the beginning of October. So we're gonna be doing a lot of a lot of work up there oh, cool. and filming up there. Yeah, where's he live? Uh, St. George. So it's not that in Right on the border. Is that the Utah border? I think so. Yeah, huh. it is. So not too he's far. close, yeah. Yeah, he's pretty <clears throat> close. And next week, I will be on the Cambridge House channel with Jay Martin. So, and I'm pretty sure, isn't that a new channel? So, I, you know, I always love it when I get to go on a new channel because I never know what they're going to ask, and it's always fun for me. So, you know, if you want to have this discussion with others in the ITM family that I know you'll find very, very knowledgeable because we all work together. 
um, all of the time. You can just schedule a Calendly meeting and just the link is below or you can give us a call and we'll set that up and it's time to have a strategy there is absolutely no doubt there are way too many things that are coming at you like so fast these days it's it's hard it's hard to keep up honestly it is but if you haven't already please do yourself a favor and subscribe. If you hit that bell notification, you'll get alerts when we go live. Um, somebody was saying that they were having some challenges with yeah, that. Yeah, a couple people actually. So, and and Edgar, what did you say was the likely they reason? Be, they have to be logged into YouTube. Oh, so you have to be logged into YouTube well, and then occasionally? It'll log you out sometimes. So it'll log you out? Make sure that you're logged in. Right. If you're logged in, then you should be getting the notifications. Right. And if you don't know how to do that, then you can call Edgar, because that's usually call what I do. Edgar. <laughs> Edgar, how do you do this? Or Sign come in, and do this click for me. the bell, <laughs> turn on notifications. It's yes, something not, like that. Not, not that hard. But please make sure that you leave us a comment as well as a thumbs up. If you like this, because honestly, we have to get this information out to as many people as we possibly can. So do not forget to share, share, share. I'm personally really excited about some of the work that I'm involved in, especially that 25 ounces. I'm really excited about this because there's just so much good information here that I think it can be, you know, I told you this, I think it could be a signature piece. Um, there is one other thing, and I know we're like at the end, so I hope, did anybody leave, Edgar? No. Okay, so there's one other thing that I want to ask you, and I didn't warn him, so. You're going to ask me a live question, <laughs> and so you're going to get a real true organic response? Absolutely. <laughs> okay, what is it? Okay, um, you had briefly mentioned that there was some shift that was occurring in the collectible market. Mm. Okay, are you ready to make a comment on what that is? Because I don't really know, other than I just bought some yesterday and yeah. I went, wow. Well, the, there's, that, there's that went a, up a lot. So a lot of the like stuff that's in the rarer coin market, right? So like Which more is the kind I like, like to buy. Yeah. Or even more rare. Oh, okay. Right. Stuff that's, you know, like 12, $13,000 or more. Yeah. Per I coin. like those. <clears throat> I so like those. Those are starting to see a lot of demand at auction. And the prices mm. have been picking up quite a bit. We've seen a, a lot of demand, and even even stuff that's way more rare um, has been setting auction records. So um, one of the auction houses just reported like so many records that were broken, and a lot of it had to do with stuff that was like twelve thousand dollars or more, which it hadn't seen a lot of price movement in the last eight years. I know, and that's why I've been buying like right, so many of those. It came you know, down. I like those sixty. You know, things wins. went up. Yeah. From two thousand to two thousand and eight, mm -hmm. and then peaked out in oh nine mm -hmm. ten. Came back down, kind of formed that cut formation that you talk yes, about and then did. have started to find their way back up. So um, we, we've just been noticing that there's been price increases in, especially in that area, area. recently. That's the a lot of demand. Goal. That's the thing right. is there's been a lot of demand for that area, Love you know, it. which she always talks about that it's a physical market and it's a true market because it's not manipulated by the spot price because supply Correct. and demand factor into the price and the value of these types of coins. So when people aren't buying them, the prices get depressed. When people are buying them, prices go up. And so we've seen a lot of demand in that area of the market, which has been nice. So. Yeah, absolutely. Though though the I, I didn't get any really, um, I didn't get a coin at that level yesterday, but I looked at the bill today, I went, wow, because I recognize those coins and I recognize the pricing. And so it seems like everything is moving now. Oh yeah. Definitely. There's been there's definitely been a, a significant price move since 2019. Yep. Yep. Okie doke. So you guys know, without any doubt in my time in my mind, it is absolutely time to cover your assets. And here at ITM Trading, we use the Wealth Shield, and the foundation is physical gold and silver. So until tomorrow. Please be safe out there. Bye-bye.